So deep neural networks. And so remember, this is basically the update equation. So h1 of t is you know, f1, and then you know, hl of t is fl for that layer. So that's the typo that we just fixed before. And then I have this output. OK, good. So how do we do, do this? Well, again, we start with the trusty time machine, right? This is you know, completely obvious. We've seen the, this line of code so many times before. You're probably upset that I'm even showing it to you. And then here we set the parameters exactly in the same way as before, with one exception. We have this extra variable num layers. Right. And here I set number of layers to two, because two is better than one. OK, good. So let's do that. And so far, nothing intelligent happens yet. The other thing, however, is so number of epochs is 3,000. That should already be a bit of a warning sign for you. Basically, it takes forever to run this thing. Maybe with a less stupid initialization, you could do it better. But this was just a quick and dirty hack, trying to keep the code as much the same as before. OK. And then I go and train. And so now, the only difference to what we have before is that I'm now setting num layers equals num layers. So this is the only extra argument that I need to pass into my LSTM cell. The LSTM cell has probably, I think, like 10 different arguments. And OK, you should look at the Gluon documentation to find out what all the other wonderful things do in it. But that's really all you need in order to run this with a, with a deeper network. And you know what you see is that actually the perplexity is pretty good. Right, so it's 1.014. So there isn't really that much information in the next bit. Mine is this training error, not test error. Um, and yeah, it produces something that looks kind of English, right? But now you begin to see the object of my whatever. OK. So this is you know, English language. It's not particularly intelligent, but fine, whatever. Let's see how well it goes. And yeah, that actually turns out to be pretty much the best thing you can do. And this is how you train a deeper RNN. So as long as um, you don't want to do anything fancy, it's very straightforward. Yes? Is perplexity necessarily like even a good measurement of like how good the model is? Because it seems like it just kind of like perplexity, minimizing perplexity lets it just say the same thing for traveler and time traveler, since we're looking at like all the words that come after the word traveler. Mm -hmm. So this is the most likely sequence, right? And it's still not a particularly intelligent model. I mean, this is still a very, very simple model. And the data set that we're training on is very small. So if you were to train on a larger data set like what you had in the homework, you might get rather more intelligent answers out of this, right? Um, the other thing is um, you may want to sample from the possible sequences rather than doing a greedy uh, next best character decoding. So what looks like the best next character may not be the next may not be the best character if I look at the longer sequence. Um, so the reason why this is the case is because well our model isn't perfectly exact insofar as it actually tries to carry around some hidden sufficient statistic well hidden approximate sufficient statistic of all the previous data right. So therefore, the best sequence over k steps isn't the one that is the best sequence for the next step each, right? So what you'll want to do is to perform beam search. We may or may not cover beam search depending on how we go with time, but there's a description of beam search in the book. Essentially, what this means is that you keep, well, 
beam search basically means like you search and you keep a beam, therefore, in you know, a set of candidates with you for the next best step. Then you expand that further. And again, you, let's say the beams, beam, width, beam, beam size is like 10. So that means 10 best candidates. Now, for each of those 10 best candidates, you explore what the next best, best action is. So you get you know, 100. Again, you keep you know, the top 10 out of those 100. And so you never let your beam get too large. But this way, at least you can explore better choices further down the line. Now, if you make your beam with infinity or, let's say, alphabet size, well, actually infinity because it keeps on growing, right? Then you will perform you know, a breadth-first search over all possible choices. And basically, beam, beam search is some restriction between you know, depth-first and breadth-first search, if you will. And that's what people do in practice. So for instance, if you use your navigation app and it offers you a number of different choices, it will do some variant of beam search to come up with the possible choices of routes that you could take. Right. Um, so for those of you who are doing something sequence related in your project, you might care about this. Now, if you have real valued numbers, then probably beam search isn't going to be the ideal thing. You might end up doing something that's closer to beam sampling. That's a separate story. Um, any other questions? Okay, good. So then, 